Welcome to How the Song Came to Be, where soulful songwriters share the stories behind their songs, as well as tools and creative practices you can use to bring your best songs or other creative works to life. I'm Ann Heaton, your host. Yeah, and also the kids are like, kids feel a great range of emotions. They feel the same range of emotions that adults do. We just, we have a, a habit of not really uh, honoring that or celebrating it. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff, a lot of the material for children is often, uh, you know, it it may be full of wonder and things like that, but it is generally about a very narrow bandwidth of emotion that includes, you know, joy, happiness, and I don't know, like nap time or something like that. Welcome to How the Song Came to Be. I'm Ann Heaton, your host, and we have three very special guests here today who I'd like to introduce. Um, we have Justin Roberts, who's a three-time Grammy nominee and truly one of the all-stars of the indie family music scene. For over 20 years, Justin has been creating the soundtrack to families' lives, helping kids navigate the joys and sorrows of growing up while allowing parents to reflect on their own childhoods. Along with his band, The Not Ready for Naptime Players, Justin has traveled the globe. He's also the author of two acclaimed picture books, The Smallest Girl in the Smallest Grade, and The Great Henry Hoffendauer, both published by Penguin Random House. Welcome, Justin. Thanks, great to be here. Thanks for being here, yeah. All right, we also have Laura Doherty, who has written and recorded five Parents' Choice award-winning children's albums with an ear for a catchy melody and a passion for creating sweet, folk-inspired songs. Laura creates music that gets even the shyest wallflower onto the dance floor. She is a longtime teaching artist at Chicago's Old Town School of Folk Music and performs all around Chicago and beyond with her band, The Heartbeats. Welcome, Laura. Thanks, Anne. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Cool. And lastly, we have Liam Davis, who is also a three-time Grammy nominee, who first achieved critical acclaim as one of the songwriters in Chicago power pop legends, Frisbee, whom Salon called one of the best, most ambitious pop bands in America. Liam wears many hats, producer, composer, engineer, multi-instrumentalist, touring performer, educator, and more. He makes his home in Evanston with his partner and their two daughters. Welcome, Liam. Thanks for having me, Anne. Yeah, I'm so happy you're here. So I'm super excited to to dive into, you know, what it means to write songs for families, for adults and kids, and how you kind of find what those universal themes are. And um, uh, but before we do that, I want to, I want to, because you guys are experts in that. But before we do that, I want to start the show uh, the way that we always do, which is by asking each of you. Uh, what was it that compelled you to start writing songs in the first place? Like, what was that that thing? And then also this a sub question: um, What was the thing that um, got you interested in working with kids? Would anyone like to start? <laughs> I'll start. Thanks, Liam. Uh, mine's pretty simple. I was in a um, I was in a band and in high school and we were playing dances and, and we had original music, but nobody was dancing to it. And so I, I was like, I'll, I'll write some songs that people can dance to. And, uh, whatever that, uh, let's hear it for the boy song by, um, Denise Williams, I think it is, was out. And so I tried to cop that and I did, I mean, I wrote like three songs, and uh, it kind of worked. Uh, people got it. And the next time we played the little dance in the activities room, people got on their feet. So that's how I started. That's so cool. If you could write something people can dance to, it's like you're yeah. giving away joy. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So what? And what about with the uh, with the children piece? Um, I mean, that basically came through my work with Justin. Really, that sort of came. Um, you know, much later, Justin had just sent me a cassette of his songs and I was like, oh, this could be a thing. Yeah, yeah. Justin, do you want to speak? Why did you send Liam a cassette of your songs? Um, so I, I got started writing kids songs, if we want to talk about that. Um, I was a preschool teacher in Minneapolis after college wow. and uh, I started doing music with the kids because the teacher, the head teacher there knew that I was 
um, then I played music. And so I started playing like Sam Cooke songs and Irish jigs and things like that with kids in addition to the itsy bitsy spider stuff. Um, and then I just decided I would write a song for the kids. They were studying apples at the time and I wrote a song called apple tree and they liked it. And I started playing other things for them that I'd written and they liked those. Um, and so after a period of time, I had a bunch of songs and I, I actually sent them as Christmas gifts to a bunch of different friends, like a five song cassette. Um, and Liam was one of them. And Liam wrote back and said, these are great songs. We should record them professionally and make an album. Oh, wow. That's so, that's amazing. I love and, that. So, I, do, so you wrote songs before you were a preschool teacher. Uh, no, I wrote songs as a preschool teacher. Okay, so you didn't... Oh, yeah, before, yeah, before. Yeah, well, I had the same, kind of the same story as Liam. I played in a a cover band in high school, junior high and high school, and uh, we would play kind of classic rock and and things like that. And, um, and then there was the local band in Des Moines, Iowa, where I grew up, called the Hollow Men, who played all original stuff, and I went and saw them, and they were at the time, you know, it was the time of like early REM records and I saw this band playing all original music and I thought, well, that's cool. I'd like to do that. So yeah. I started trying to write songs and um, because it was the songs I was writing at that time were definitely REM inspired. The lyrics were not very important and I could ah. <laughs> mumble things and uh, you know, play jangly chords. And that was the first songs I wrote. Oh, cool. I like that. It's like a little less vulnerable. Totally. A lot less vulnerable. <laughs> Find your way in. Just be like, no, you don't know what I'm saying. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Abstract awesome. Abstract was really cool. <laughs> like, what'd, what'd you say? I said abstract was really cool. Like the weirder they could be, the better. Totally. Totally. Um, how about you, Laura? Um, well, I started playing guitar in high school uh, and I was, I wasn't in any bands or anything, but I was, um, soaking up playing cover songs you know Beatles, Crosby, Stills and Nash like anything with you know great melodies and harmonies and then I started writing songs in college I think between like freshman and sophomore year I was home it was usually just home for the summer and uh, my parents were like you need to go get a job you know so my actually my dad helped me get this internship at the the electric company, uh, well, in New York, it's called Con Ed. It's the same thing as Comet. Oh, Con Ed, yeah. Yeah, and it was like the most boring job on the face of it, like the opposite of making music. And uh, they didn't, you know, they didn't really have anything for me to do when I first started. Like they just made up this internship. So I remember sitting in this office all day, and I, I think that's when I started. I just was so bored that I just started writing songs um and they weren't very good and they were mostly like songs about longing like things that like I wanted to happen in my life that hadn't really happened and um but I remember one of the first songs I wrote was called Traveling Girl and and my mom was always I always like would bounce stuff off of her and I remember she was like we were in the she was always ironing in the family room and I remember sitting there with the guitar and she's like why don't you write a song about all the places you want to travel to. <laughs> and it's still a song that I play today. It's like one of the ones. I know I that song. Be what? You what? I know that song. You do? Well, what song is it? I feel like you name a lot of places. Uh, yeah, Traveling Girl. I'm a traveling girl. I travel around the world. Yeah. yeah so I recorded it on my first like solo record. Okay. Um, I mean, the other ones weren't that good. But I thought that one I still kind of play out. And it's, it's kind of fun and reminds me of my younger self. So that's how I, yeah, that's kind of how I got started. It was just out of boredom, boredom. <laughs> this summer job. Being um, boredom is so underrated. Right. Okay. Yeah. And then the kids music um, came later when I was working at Old Town School. And I was, so I was already working with kids um, and playing all folk and tr traditional kid songs. And it, all these people around me, you know, Justin and other people were, were writing uh you know, writing their own songs. I thought maybe I should try that. Yeah. Um, and my, my first kid song I wrote was the L train song and I wrote it on the train. I was like running late to a gig and I, I just started singing these words about the L train. And then I tried it out 
in my classes and and I noticed parents we just were going around in a circle on a train and I noticed parents were singing it right away I thought oh okay this must be pretty good if like they're catching on to the lyrics and so that's kind of how that all started oh that's awesome cool well this is a good segue because I and so I sort of find my way into the questions by my own experience but like I remember once I was playing a song in my living room it's called jump it's kind of a sad song you know adults like it whatever and I look but I was practicing it for a gig and I look behind me and my kid is like collapsed on the table like I'm like what's wrong she's like that song is so sad like you know it was like I drained all the energy from her body like I was harming her with the song so I was like wow you know and then later I was playing this other song watching you win and she was up dancing and I was like okay yeah like kind of like this is the ultimate litmus test so I guess I kind of want to talk about the fluidity of songs like how you guys approach writing like how you know something is going to work you know for all for all ages and I know Laura you 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 wrote in the email to me just about like how sometimes you'll tell a really personal story and I'm really struck by like that song about being shy or the song about making a friend some of those things were things you experienced as a kid but they were also things you experienced as a, an adult but the kids mm -hmm. totally resonate with it so I I don't know the right question to ask but I would love to just hear from you all about like you know, what's your process around that? Like, are there some songs that you're like, this is not going to work? Or do you, do you have a special way of approaching it? Um, and Justin, you sent that super cool quote from yeah. Maurice, is it Sendak? Yeah. Who, correct me if I'm wrong, illustrated Where the Wild Things Are? Yes. Yeah, and he said something like, I don't believe in childhood. I don't believe in any, um, like, demarcation. You just tell kids things that are true. And I was just like, wow. <laughs> Early on in his career, I guess, even with Where the Wild Things Are, that um, book got rejected a lot because people were like, you know, you're, the kid's saying he's going to eat up his, his mom and there's all these crazy things happening in the story. And he was like, tell children anything you want, just as long as it's the truth. Like, yeah. you, you shouldn't hide anything from children. Yeah. Tell them the truth. And I think that that's a great way to do it. In terms of your question, I would say, um, I never know what is going to reach kids. And I've realized over the years when I think I've written a song that, okay, this is for the adults. You know, this is a song on the record that a mom or dad will enjoy, you know, in the course of the album, but the kids won't really get it. Then I'll have a, a four-year-old come up and say, that's their favorite song. And like an example of that is I wrote this song called Never Getting Lost. It's about a kid getting lost at the mall. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I never really thought, I thought parents would relate to it because it was sort of a complex song and, and also difficult emotions. Um, but I had a, a four-year-old come up to me in Seattle and his mom said, his favorite song is Never Getting Lost. And I said, oh, wow, you know, has he gotten lost before? Or is that why he likes the song? And she said, no, he's never gotten lost, but he just worries about people who are lost and he wants to help them. Oh. <laughs> so like stuff like that oh. is always the great surprise and in, in writing songs and so I put things on albums that I just have no idea if kids are going to like or not for sure just stuff yeah. that I like yeah 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 I mean I was always struck like upon I mean I know this is more common now um but just the first time I heard your music just being like this is you know, like I thought it was going to be kids music. I'm like, oh no, this is like for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, this, like I want to listen to this. This like sounds awesome, you know? And so, um, I, I don't, I mean, I think it's a special talent to be able to, to pull that off. It's, it's, uh, I, I also, I think about Maurice Sendak in this way, when he gets asked about why he writes for children, he's like, I don't really have a choice. That's just what I do. I, this is the thing. This is the art I make. And, for some reason, this is the, the moments in time that I care about. And I have a really, uh, you know, each says I have a really deep memory for these moments in time and the way I felt as a child. And so that's yeah. where his art comes from. And I think in some ways, a lot of what I do is that as well. And yeah. Do you feel like you have a special, con I mean, like, do you feel like you have a special connection with kids and that's what makes you well suited to like are there any songs that you pull out and you're like this is not going on the record this is like for something else uh, 
Rarely. <laughs> Sometimes to a fault, maybe I put things on records that don't belong on kids' records. But um, no, I think, I mean, I think for me, my childhood memories are pretty vivid of certain parts of my childhood. And so I think like that stuff comes out, but it's also, I think it's also just about storytelling and getting inside a character's head. And, you know, I often think about like, Bruce Springsteen or something. It's like he wasn't a coal miner, but he can write a song, you know, from that perspective really well. Right. And it's the same thing, you know, if you're writing a song where you're taking a child's perspective or you're taking a parent's perspective, you know, you're getting inside a character's head and telling a story. And if right. you can do that well, you know, in one genre, I don't, you know, it's just about imagining the character who you're telling the story about. Right. So. Right, right, right. What about you, Laura? Um, so I think for me, uh, when I was first starting to write songs for kids, I, I was in the classroom so much with like really young, like under five. Yeah. Um, and so I, I definitely like came at it with like an educational standpoint, like, okay, we're going to learn something and have fun. And I, cause I remember thinking I, I remember thinking uh, maybe I can do this as a career. Like I never, I never thought that I would, you know, be a songwriter for a living like <laughs> for like adult music. But then for kids, I sort of, I saw this Avenue. I'm like, Oh, I can work in schools and I can, it, it just kind of hit me one year. I'm like, maybe I can actually do this and make music for a living. So the, the educational piece was kind of, it was important for me in, in the, at first. Yeah. And um, I'm losing my train of thought, but uh, so, and then I think as after a couple of albums, I started to kind of put a little more of my heart into songs and a little uh -huh. bit more of my emotions. Oh and yeah, I, and I think that's been a good thing. Like my, I've been working with the same producer, um, Rich Rankin, in Chicago here for all my albums, and we all, we talk a lot in the studio even just on one line, like, oh, it's, does that sound too adult? Or did, will, the, will the kids get that? Do we care? You know? Yeah. And I remember, like, with the song I have, It's Okay to Be Shy, I think at first he had said, oh, that, that might be too adult. And I think I, I actually it didn't end up on a, the, until the next record. Like, yeah. we sort of nixed it at first, and then I brought it back. I'm like, I really want to do this song. And, and uh yeah, I'm not saying, I mean, he would have let me do whatever I want, but, right. <laughs> but we definitely had like a discussion about it. And I was like, well, I think this song will work. Um, and I have had parents say to me, oh, you know, you know, my child's very shy. Um, and they, that song spoke to them. So I love that. I mean, I feel yeah. like there's these like assumptions that we make, but it's like what Justin said, like they get turned, like I would have assumed you wrote, it's okay to be shy for kids. But then when I hear it, I'm like, it is. <laughs> Finally, someone's telling me that it's okay. Like, I, you know, I feel like you wrote it for me in my 40s, you know? <laughs> Laura just reminded me of, of uh, a moment early on. I was working on my second record for kids, and uh, I had written this song that I was never, ever going to put out for children um, called Mama is Sad. It uh, was all about yeah. this kid trying to cheer up his mother who was sad. And I wrote it and it, in some ways I was almost laughing because it was so horribly sad. Like as I was writing it, I was like, I can never do this. And I, Liam, who's produced all of my records, um, I played it for him and he was like, we have to put this on a record. Yeah. And he was so right because since then, there are some people who skip over that track because it's sad and they don't want to listen to it. And there are other people who are like, either like someone going through postpartum depression or, or a child who's, just interested in that emotion like that song comes up and like that's the song they want to listen to and it you know i that was a real eye-opening experience of like no you can have really hard deep emotions on a record for kids and you know liam was someone who pushed me in that direction to do it because i think at the time i would have avoided it maybe that's amazing yeah well i feel like a lot of kids feel a lot of <laughs> A lot of kids' moms are sad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the, at least the at other, some point, and a lot of kids feel like they have to fix it. So, like, having that song is just, like, kind of, like... 
you know, a little bit of a balm, like, oh, I'm not the only kid. Like, okay, like that validation, like this, this happens. Yeah. Yeah. And also the kids are like, kids feel a great range of emotions. They feel the same range of emotions that adults do. We just, we have a, a habit of not really uh, honoring that or celebrating it. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff, a lot of the material for children is often, uh, you know, it, it may be full of wonder and things like that, but it is generally about a very narrow bandwidth of emotion that includes, you know, joy, happiness, and I don't know, like nap time or something like that. And kids feel really complex, deep, you know, dark emotions, uh, and are, are, feeling them often for the first time and, and trying to figure out what they are. And, and, you know, songs like mama is sad is going to help everybody in the family with that. You know, yeah. and that's when Justin played it for me, I was like, this is, and also I, you know, coming from a, a, a divorced parents, I was like, this has to go on the record. It's yeah. Kind of yeah, absolutely. I mean, I feel like kids are picking up on all of the emotions in a household, but they don't always, can't always name what they are. So something like mama is sad is like, okay, that gives me like kind of a, a, like a place to put that. I know that even when we watch TV, my, if I say something to the TV, my kid will be like, mama, stop throwing your emotions all over the place. <laughs> 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 like, like I'm polluting the area. You know what I mean? Like, I'm like, wow, like all I did. Yeah. Like, okay. So, um, that's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, this is very exciting. I love I love that example. I think that's just such a great example. Is um Laura, did you want to did you want to play that song? Is that was this the song you wanted to play or were you going to play a different song? Um yeah, I'd like this one. I'd like to play this one. Yeah. Yeah. Can we do that. Now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure, why not? Why not? <laughs> the um the it's okay to be shy one? Yeah, it's okay yeah. to be shy. Yeah. Okay. It's okay to be shy, it's okay to be shy. I know you're watching the world with your own two eyes. And it's okay to be quiet, it's okay to be quiet. Come on everybody, let's try it. It's okay to wait till you've got something to say. And when you've got something to say, we're going to listen to you. If you're shy or you're silly or you're quiet or you're loud, it doesn't matter, I'll always be proud of you. Ba -ba -da -da -da. It's okay to be shy, I tell you so was I. I was watching the world with my own two eyes, with my own two eyes. It's okay to be shy. You can watch the world with your own two eyes. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. So I forgot to ask you, I know that you talked about it maybe not going on the record and then it did when I, on a subsequent record, but what was the thing that made you write that? What's the story behind it? Um, well, so I, I was pretty shy and quiet when I was, I, I would say like up until I was in college, <laughs> I was just kind of a quieter kid. Um, and even like as an adult, if I was in a, you know, a meeting or something uh, like I, I just never was the one to speak up. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, but I could get on a stage and play. It's crazy. But 
Right. Um, I just remember like my, my grandparents would come over. My grandma was really boisterous and like she would say to my mom, well, I, I mean, I was like, you know, seven years old and she'd say, well, she's so shy, you know, and it just like, it sounded like a negative thing, kind of like, you know, right. when is she, when is she going to grow out of that? You know, it's just like never felt good to hear it, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it probably, she wasn't meaning anything. I mean, I hear parents say it all the time. Oh, he's so shy. She's so shy. And um, so I just kind of internalize like, oh, you know, this isn't the best quality that I have, of, you know. Oh, yeah. And, um, and I, you know, I did, I think I did grow out of it mostly. But um, I remember in my 20s, one of my first jobs in Chicago, I worked in this office. And this coworker came up to me and said, you're so shy. <laughs> I was like, yep, I've heard that my whole life. Oh, yeah. And she said, well, I think that's a really good thing. And that was like the first time I'd ever heard somebody say it's a good thing. Like, I just, I was yeah. like delighted to hear. I was like, oh, it just was like this new perspective. Like, oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. And so ever since then, I, you know, I kind of just embraced. I was like, okay, yeah, I'm not the loudest one in the room. And I'm, I'm happy about that. I don't want to yeah. be the loudest person in the room. And um so and then the song just came came out of that like because I, I just know what that feels like to be to be sh I think shy kids are also just they're observers they're like watching what's yeah. going on around them and I, yeah taking it in yeah and that's all okay and I think parent I mean I'm not a parent myself but I think parents they want their kids to be more outgoing maybe or they you know they want them to yeah. Like I remember my mom saying, say hi to Mrs. So-and-so, you know, and I'd be like all scared to say hi to like the neighbor. <laughs> Make so, eye contact. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting. Yeah. That's cool. It occur It occurs to me to say, um, you know, maybe we're all, it's just like not societally acceptable to be shy. Maybe we're all a little bit shyer. Like I was thinking like how I can be judgmental of shy people and I think it's because I'm shy and I feel like I'm forcing myself to overcome it and then I'm like, why do I have to do all the work? You know what I mean? It's like, well, it would be nice if it were more acceptable for us to coexist, like mm -hmm. share in shared space without having to like talk all the time. Like, could that be comfortable instead of like awkward? Like, it's do like we that scene need to be in, awkward that we're hanging out It's like silence? that scene in, when Harry met Sally when Billy Crystal says, isn't it nice we can sit here and not talk? <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally. It works in Quaker meeting. <laughs> well, it works in Quaker meeting, yeah. And it's part of what it's about. I think I love that second uh, line, Laura, uh, you can watch the world or see the world with your own two eyes. It's very much like the idea of, um, like my younger daughter is very shy, but, uh, but it's mostly because, I mean, you just watch her paying attention. Like uh -huh. she actually loves to sit, she loves to sit at a table of adults and just like check it out and see what, you know, what behaviors are like. And like, she's just constantly paying attention. Mm -hmm. And I was very shy as a kid too. And that's, I just remember watching, you know, yeah. paying attention, watching, paying attention, watching. Uh -huh. So I think there's something to that. Like you know? The underlying message you're giving kids and adults is like, it's okay to, for you to be you like you're okay you know and that's that's a big yeah that's a, a, a big service to do it's reminding me have, have any of you read the book quiet that's all about introverts and the power of that kind of idea that it, it gets downplayed in society you know we're always wanting to be the loud people in the room and we think those are the most successful people but there's a book kind of all about discounting that idea mm -hmm. yeah it's a, you know, very important and powerful and great leaders and all these other things. Is that that, like, th that woman, Susan, who gave, like, the introversion TED Talk or something? Yeah. Is, yeah that that's her, okay, the, the book is Quiet? Yeah. Okay. The interesting book about that idea, because I think. Okay. Well, I'm feeling a little shy now, so I think I'm going to go. <laughs> go check it out. <laughs> I mean, I'll talk to you later. No. <laughs> um, cool. Well, thank you so much, Laura, for playing that. Um, sure. I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about um, if you guys would be willing to share things that you feel like you've learned, you know, from kids, like what you've learned from working with kids in terms of songs or, or anything really. <laughs> I, I can go first if it helps to break the ice. 
<laughs> despite my shyness. Let me see, what have I learned? Um, um, I feel like I've learned that, um, well, I always think of myself as not a kid person. So it's like, I, I like to work with teenagers. I like to work with adults. And then I had kids, but I would always, you know, so then I started working with kids and doing music workshops and songwriting, but I would always say like, oh, but I'm not a kid person. Like I'm not my brother who, uh, you know, is like the human jungle gym and super playful and kids want to play with him because they sort of think he's a kid, you know? And so I, I always would say that. And then my friend said, I was like, yeah, I'm doing this, you know, but I'm not a kid person. And then she's like, well, I think that's why my kid likes you because he just sort of talked to her like she's a person, you know? And I thought, oh yeah, like it was kind of like making room for, there are many ways to interact with children. You know, there's that really fun way. Like I remember loving relatives who I felt like were kids in adult bodies, right? But then there's also the adults who just speak to you, like, you know, like soul to soul. So I thought, so I've learned that. I've learned that it's okay that to have there be different ways of being with kids. I mean, I like to be playful too, but, um, and the other thing I feel like I've learned is just in terms of the songwriting, like I, as Liam knows, I have two songs and each were inspired by a different kid. One is the donut song, or I think I sent it to you too, Justin, but <laughs> like, hilarious. You know, just, just like that song. And then this other song, the celebration song, both were inspired by my kids. And I just realized they have this, uh, access to like unbridled joy and this access to like, they know exactly what they want, you know, and mm -hmm. that I feel like it's been a little muted in me as an adult. And so um, being able to write that donut song, I thought like, well, this is so much more fun than a song I would have thought of on my own. And the celebration song, I never would have thought of on my own, but it was like, it gave me something to hang all of my experiences around this unbridled joy which connected me back with my own, you know, my own joy, which was awesome. And it was just like, you know, children opening the window uh, for me and being my, and being my teacher. So, and I don't have nearly as much experience working with kids as you guys do. So now that I, I, I can relate broke to that. the ice. And um, I think about like when I was living in Minneapolis and uh, working at the preschool in the early nineties, I was playing in this uh, alternative folk band that, I'd formed in college with uh, two friends and uh, we were performing around and I was writing songs for that. And, you know, it was often pretty serious songs that I would tend to write for this group. And um, for some reason, when I started writing for kids, I felt this ability to like write a silly song. You know, I wrote this song called everything else starts with E that's an alphabet song, but it's just kind of silly stream of consciousness. And yeah, it gave me the ability to do that because I wasn't doing that in the group I was playing in. I was writing, you know, very serious ballads. And uh, I think that, yeah, that kind of opened me up and made me realize, oh, I could, you know, I can just write a silly song about eating cookies. And, and that, it felt good to just sort of be silly and, and write a song in that way. Um, and I think in terms of like what kids have taught me, I think it's what I value about kids in general. It's just that they're honest and they are exactly who they are and they're going to say exactly what they're going to say. And yeah, I, I love that in people in general. Uh, but in kids, you know, the honesty comes out, you know, whether it's like I'm bored, <laughs> you know, of this concert, <laughs> I want to leave, which I think is great. Like, you know, just tell it like it is. Um, but it also, uh, just comes out in how they react to songs and, and things that they'll say, you know, the, the way that they're feeling from a certain song, they'll just tell you exactly what is on their mind. And I, I like, I love that about kids. And I think that is a trait that we could all use more of in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And do you feel like your songs are like, you know, early on you were writing these ballads and then you could write about cookies. Do you feel like there's been some, like an integration that's taken place or you kind of go back and forth or. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, now the, my most recent record is like my 14th kids record. So I've made a lot of them and I think to keep it interesting to me, it's been, a, I've had to find ways to 
express whatever emotions I need to express as a human being through this medium. So uh, yeah. I find sometimes, you know, I'm writing a song like uh, a song about Halloween. I have this song called Trick or Treat where uh, it's all about collecting as much candy as you can. And the, the little memory that, that sparked the song was me remembering my brother and I getting all our candy home from the night and like spreading it out on the floor and he would alphabetize his candy in order. And I was just, so I thought of that, like that feeling of having all that candy and like wanting to do things like alphabetizing it because you're so proud of what you have. But as I was writing that song, uh, you know, I started the bridge to that. Um, uh, something like the, the sky is getting halfway dark, my bags up to the halfway mark. And for me, it was more about middle-aged, <laughs> like being middle-aged and sort of the autumn and, and fall coming in and all of these things. And to me, that's where like it hit me in the heart when I was writing it because it was, that's what I was feeling. But the song's really just about trick-or-treating and it's about a fall and, you know, and, and, and the beautiful part of like collecting candy. But like for me, it, it had other meanings. And I think that part of writing is what keeps it interesting to me is because I'm still able to find the heart for myself. Right. It's just about, I'm going to write about a certain childhood experience. It's about what, what am I going through right now and how can I express that through a metaphor that has to do with children? I think that yeah. often happens. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So it's, a, it's kind of got two, it's got two levels and you are feeling expressed through it and yet it can be enjoyed on a purely. Yeah. No one needs to know that. Although now they do. Right. <laughs> you're, you've outed yourself. You're like, here's the contemplative part. Here it comes. <laughs> How yeah, about the other you? Th uh, the, the thing that, I, I mean, I think, um, I think Justin and I have talked enough about this that I think uh, I can speak for him in this regard. Uh, Laura, I don't know about you, but um, there's something that I think we do as adult uh, creators, uh, or, but specifically as songwriters, um, where, and certainly I did this, uh, in my, uh, in my twenties, um, is to constantly grapple with, uh, you know, what your voice is and what, what, what it is that you want to say, and are you saying it the right way? And is it codified enough so that it will come across in this, um, you know, uh, with the right kind of uh, pretense or message or, you know, it's, uh, it's constantly about this sort of um, how is my stuff coming across? You know, it's like, uh, it's like why in adolescence you respond to the obscurity in, in uh, the REM lyrics or whatever it is. And, uh, and one of the things that I have learned uh, is Justin and I go around to elementary schools and we teach uh, songwriting uh, to kids and we basically just write songs with them is they're, uh, they're free. They don't have any of that. There's no trappings. There's no, I mean, it starts to creep in around sixth grade, but uh, elementary kids are just like, it's just out. And having witnessed, um, you know, having followed Justin's songwriting very closely because we've been friends for, you know, since we were, 19 or 20, um, watching that transition from adult songwriter, Justin to kids songwriter, Justin, he was just like free. And it was like, yeah. you know, here's, you know, this is a song about a whale named Willie and here's the song about cookies and here's a song. And it was like, not only were the songs full of truths, but he was, you know, prolific about it like yeah. like couldn't stop you know couldn't study his sanskrit because he was writing willie was a whale or whatever and so <laughs> yeah you know for uh for me as a songwriter uh it's helped uh hugely just to remind myself that i don't need to be thinking about anything other than saying something like syntax says about saying something that's true you know, yeah. or finding some kernel of truth, like Justin was saying about Springsteen or imagining yourself in a character, all you need is like one little kernel of truth in there. Um, you know, like you're, uh, 
like your feelings about midlife and in trick or treating or whatever uh, to get it across. And the other thing that I, that I've learned uh, from kids is, and that I um, greatly admire, is that they not only are they honest, but if you are being dishonest with them, they will <laughs> sniff it out immediately. Yeah. And and so as an artist, again as a performer, you can't get away with faking it. You know, yes. it, it just won't go over. Yeah. 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 That's amazing. I thank you for saying all that stuff. I feel like there's like a, I don't know, conscious or subconscious like delineation that goes on with songwriters. I know with me where, you know, is this something worth writing about? Is this interesting? You know, um, is this special, you know, and then working with kids, you know, it's just summer, like what my summer vacation or it's like or there was a song somebody wrote the whole song was basically like my favorite person <laughs> my favorite person my favorite person <laughs> my favorite person and i was like this is like a better song than yeah. any of the songs that i write you know what i mean but i wouldn't have let myself write that like and so just sh shifting the context um yeah it's great thank you so I'm sorry you can't um, fool or lie to your students anymore. <laughs> yeah, I really want to. I really want to go around the country lying to kids. It just doesn't work. It doesn't work, yeah. Oh, oh well. Is there, a, uh, is there something that you wanted to share? I think you had some songs that um, you had mentioned over email. Um, yeah. Does that apply to now in terms of what you've learned from working with children? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we, about a year ago, um, Justin and I went to uh, this school in the greater Detroit area um, and we worked, we did a song organ assembly with the third grade and the fourth grade and the fifth grade. Um, and sometimes you get to a school where they have maybe a really good music program or they have a really good writing program or there's just a culture to the school that uh, promotes creativity or whatever, but we were uh, we were both really struck by uh, what these kids came up with and the difference between the third grade, what the third grade had to offer and what the fifth grade had to offer. So I'm going to play the third grade oh. one first. It's just a, we, we basically, we just, we have them write a couple couplets and a chorus, two verses and a chorus. And so or a verse and a chorus. Are you giving them like the same prompt or it's just what they come, come up with? No, it's, uh, I mean, it, uh, it starts out with a standardized sort of let's um, let's use words to paint a picture okay. uh, and it can be about anything you like or it can uh, you know it can evoke a feeling or it can be somewhere that some physical place that you are something like that and so we get a line from them and then we ask them to come up with a melody and and so we and then we just harmonize the uh, the melody on guitar and then we take it from there so mm -hmm. <clears throat> this is the third grade. Uh, I should say, I don't think I've heard this since we did it, and I don't even remember what it is, so it's going to be fun to hear. Uh, yeah, this will, <laughs> you're going to enjoy this. The crickets are chirping, my shoes full of dew. Everything quiet, the sounds become new. The sky turns purple, then darker and dim. The stars are drifting, they've gone for a swim. It's hard to remember, it happens every day. It's hard to remember, it happens every day. Aww. So, right? It's just like basically uh, Twilight. It's just a song about Twilight. And that's the third grade. That's the, uh, you know. Those are all their words and that's their melody. And, and, they, and they sing it as a group and it's super sweet. And we were really blown away. And, and then the fifth graders came in and they did this. In the silent city, the lights are low. I can feel the pipes flowing below. The wind like a lion outside I see the sun and so I hide nothing left in the 
night. The sun and moon start to fight. Nothing left in the night. Nothing left in the night. <laughs> Wow. So, right? They, they've got this whole like post urban apocalyptic thing where the, you know, there's no day and night anymore. And like they're grappling with, you know, they've, they've got their, their hormones coming. And, the, and I you get the <laughs> sense that they sort of understand that. And they're like, it's all darkness. And oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, I can feel like the preteen, like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wave. And, Right. Wow, and, uh, Laura, I bet you can attest to this too. But uh, it's it's very consistent. Fifth grade, like that's a that is a fifth grade uh, way of seeing the world. You know. Wow. Yeah, I, I've um, I've mo I actually mostly just work with kids kindergarten and younger. So like, wow. I wouldn't even know what to do with a fifth grader. <laughs> uh, but I've I have done songwriting um, with kindergartners. And a little bit preschool, but um, and I I let them come up with the topic, and, I, and we just do like four lines of a song. We don't we don't even barely get to a chorus. Sure. Um, but I love I love doing it with the kids because they it's like they I say I tell them we're gonna write a song that we're gonna finish today, and we re I record it on the the phone, you know, so they can hear themselves, and. I'm only at this school once a month and I I'll come back a month later and they'll say, you know, can we do the candy store song? You know, like they, it's like they own the song. They, it's like their favorite thing because they got to do it together. And, and, you know, and I, I come up with the music part, but they, it's like they, they get to write the lyrics. And so they feel, they feel special. That it's, um, it's like their song. Yeah. That's so cool. I often think it would be fun. Like there's so many songs that, um, get written with kids like I'm like and where do they like I'm like I should make a record of their songs you know like just to add to my to-do list but like it just seems yeah. like it'd be so fun to like because they're great you know and they're like some of them yeah they're catchy I mean yeah it's it's fun yeah and they're true hey Justin is there any song that you'd like to uh, share with us that um, kind of relates to what we've been talking about I don't know how it relates to what we've been talking about, but <laughs> yeah, just play something that doesn't relate to what we've been talking about. Yeah. Uh, so this is a song called From Scratch, uh, and I wrote it um, after my grandmother passed away, and it's just about thinking about. I had a my mom in the '70s was uh, not so much of a cook, uh, and we would go to my grandmother's house and it was like a mysterious place because she was spending, you know, days making strudel and things like that. And I would watch her in the kitchen and, um, kind of inspired my love of cooking. Um, and years later when she was in her nineties, I went to visit her and I made her like homemade pasta, which was kind of the similar equivalent of the strudel that she used to make. And, uh, it was fun to have her just sitting down, and me doing all the work for once. But anyway, the song's about her from scratch. My grandma is old fashioned. Dad says they broke the mold, whatever that means. She's got an old gas stove. It's like a treasure trove. She lights with a match. She's making everything, and I mean everything from scratch. She is standing by the stove, stirring. Her cat is in the kitchen, purring. Smells so good in here. I just want to close the door and hook the latch. She's making everything and I mean everything from scratch. She takes a little, makes a lot. Be careful, sis, it's kind of hot. Is there more inside that pot from scratch?
There's always grown-ups in this room talking. So I put my leash upon my dog and I go walking. And as that timer clicks by, maybe dad and I will play a game of catch. Cause you can do anything when you're making everything from scratch. Grandma, I don't know what you did while you were cooking. But you made my dad look like a kid when he was looking at all those chocolate chips and icy cold milk sips. Let's hide the entire batch. Cause you made everything and I mean everything from scratch. Dinner time is done, but there's food to wrap. Nearly everyone could use a nap. But we can hardly move to our seats. We're glued. It's like we're attached. She made everything and we ate everything from scratch. She takes a little, makes a lot. Be careful, sis, it's kind of hot. Is there more inside that pot? Hoping so and thinking not. She gave us much more than we thought from scratch. From scratch. <laughs> oh that's so awesome justin thank you so much it's so beautiful how like <clears throat> you paint such a beautiful picture and like how how it feel the profundity of feeling in, in that or it's such an ordinary ordinary moment in the kitchen yeah. thank you thanks beautiful. yeah cool um so i want to ask you something else um I've been feeling lately like I have, I, I'm a meditator and sometimes I get like these ideas, but I was, I had this experience recently where I, I sort of um, saw kids faces like young kids who've not been able to stay on the planet. Um, and I just, I had this feeling of like, you know, what if, you know, what if that this, that child had had this experience or had this outlet, you know, I know there's not, always a correlation there are complicated reasons for why young kids can be unhappy but um it's just inspired me to be a little bit more brave and so i i wondered if you could if any if you guys could give any advice to people who maybe are musicians or songwriters um people who tune in who maybe haven't worked with kids but have been thinking about it um you know like advice about about doing that like what you feel like they need or um if you could, because I feel like there, are, like I think Liam, it was you that maybe said something like, "You and Justin will go in," and there are some places where that might be the only. Was it you that the only yeah. musical experience they'll get yeah. the whole year or something like yeah, that? And so I was semester, right? getting that feeling like there's a lot of children out there, and um, so there's no reason why uh, you know more people can't be doing that that kind of work if they feel called or interested in doing it. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I think Liam and I share this similar uh, experience, but I remember being in elementary school and a musician coming in for an assembly and uh, he was just making up songs based on kids' um, suggestions. And it was just like this, there was a silliness to it. And I was also like, wow, this guy's just making up songs and, and he comes to schools and he plays music. And like, I remember that being so inspiring, like to see it as a kid, um, you know, that it, it got my wheels turning in terms of what I wanted to do in my life. And it was like, I think those experiences in school and the, the different, you know, assemblies and outside people that they bring in uh, speak to a lot of different things that 
you know, kids can be exposed to. So for me, that was a big inspiration was an assembly. So when Liam and I started doing assemblies together in the back of my head, I was thinking, you know, there's going to be kids out there are going to be like, this is so cool. You get to do this. And I, I want to do that. And I want to learn how to play an instrument. I want to write a song, all that kind of stuff. So. Right. Right. So you, you, you remember what it was like for you when you go in and that's sort of an inspiration. Do, yeah. do you feel like there's any like tools that you need? Like, okay, here's what you need to know. Like 101, if you want to work with, you know, I mean, it's a lot of trial and error, but, uh, you know, I, the first album that I, I made, uh, Great Big Sun, um, it was, I hadn't really been performing those songs a lot for kids. And I suddenly learned that, um, you know, when you perform them for kids, it's different than just playing them on a record. You have to sort of find something to attach the audience to it and keep them involved. And so I think over the years of doing assemblies, Liam and I've learned a lot of tricks when things are not going well and we're losing the audience, how to bring them back. And, you know, that's just trial and error kind of stuff, but you want to constantly have things where you can be bringing the audience back and doing interactive things with them to keep them interested. And, you know, some of it is the simple things you all remember from, from school when you're like, everyone put your hands on their head, just like whatever it is, just to get kids back and centered and watching you again. And, paying attention. Um, right. But it's also, you know, whatever you're doing, it has to involve them. It's not just a, a one-sided performance, like a, a singer songwriter kind of thing. It's, it's much more of a communal group experience where the audience is part of the show and, right. uh, or the assembly is, you know, you're, you're working with the kids and you're not just performing at them. Right. But, right. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I totally agree with the trial and error. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, all my kids song, most of my kids songs get tested out in a classroom with kids first. But actually one thing I've learned recently, like in the past year, even though I've been doing this like 10 years, um, I notice like I play at a lot of libraries. So if I'm playing like a big concert with kid kids and parents, they, when they come in, I think kids are so, especially when they get into elementary school, they're so used to be told to, be quiet and sit down. And so it's, I, I noticed my very first song, I've been kind of changing up, like the very first song, they're, they're just not sure they're allowed to move and clap. Mm-hmm. And like, so I've changed my set where I, I let them jump in the very first song. Whatever I'm doing is like, we're gonna jump. And as soon as they start jumping, that, they're like, oh my gosh, I, and then it, like, then it's all of a sudden fun for them. I mean, maybe they're still having fun, but when they're staring back at me, I think, oh gosh, they, maybe they just don't know that they can. Yeah, yeah. I think they're just so used to being like directed to do things. Yeah, yeah. So I, sure. I kind of changed the way I do things a little bit, just to right away, right off the bat, get them to free up their body, and then, and then it just it goes so much better they're like they don't notice that like they're being told what to do <laughs> or they're being yeah they're they're freer to express their physical you know move their bodies yeah that's a great highlight so it's like you know you in a way you're like you're setting down a new set of rules it just happens to be one where they're more free but you do that right up front so they're not apprehensive like yeah. how act in this case yeah and and sometimes it depends on like what kind of community I'm in like I, I notice if I'm you know if I'm in an area a wealthier area where I know kids are have iPads and they're just have so much exposure to things sometimes those kids are like they give you that look of like okay what do you got for me you know and then sometimes I'm in other areas that they maybe don't, don't get as much music and they're right there with you from the second you start and that's that's an interesting thing to see too so yeah that's definitely been our experience really yeah in what way well um just that the 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 communities that are um for lack of a better word underserved uh are um you know seem to be much more receptive uh and much more ready to engage um than the overserved communities i guess um I just think that there, uh, like Laura said, there's just a lot um, 
you know, kids have access now to just uh, so much stimulation uh, that, um, and it's, you know, now it's virtual stimulation, which is, you know, the real world is rarely going to live up to that consistently. And so I think that can be kind of a difficulty. But I do want to say that um, the thing, I think part of the, the importance of uh, music um, and the role that it, it, it can play in, uh, it, it, especially in the life of a, of a, a child at school is that um, like, like Laura was getting at is it, it offers a chance for play. I mean, that's why we use the word play when we talk about that's how you do music, you play it, you know, musicians play music together. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, what, I mean, we do the same thing. Uh, once you get the kids engaged in some kind of physical activity, they're like, we're, Oh, I'm doing this too. We're playing together. You know, like kids don't get together and you know, one of them watches the other play. They, it's like it's totally participatory, and so um, I think it's part of the value uh, of giving the kids something that isn't, you know, it's structured. Um, it's not recess, but uh, but it's but it's play, um, and it and it accesses different parts of their their brains and their bodies. And so, do you guys, I know you do the song. Do you guys also, when you are playing, like let them dance or let them play tambourine or like like that kind of thing? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Well, generally speaking, we do uh, we do the songwriting assemblies for later elementary, um, and we do the uh, we do other other stuff for for K to two where we do yeah we get them up and get them moving around and get them singing and or shouting or whatever it yeah. is. I know you're uh, reminding, I know for me, like a barrier, I'll just share this for anybody who might be listening, who thinks, you know, that maybe they don't have the tools is that I felt comfortable when I felt comfortable working with younger kids and or older kids. And then I knew I'd be working with younger kids. I just like went on YouTube for tricks, you know, like tricks, like, cause it's the same content of writing a song, but like, how do I get a six year old to, to pay attention? Okay. Like every half an hour, we do freeze dance, you know, or like there's this rubbing your hands thing, like when kids get really animated and you need them to settle and then you put it on your eyes. Like I just uh, looked for those little, little tricks to help me. And it was amazing. Cause I always think stuff is so much more complicated than it is. And like the tricks actually work. I'm like, totally. Oh my gosh. Like yeah. all I had to do was watch a YouTube video and add this to the mix. Um, yeah. So anyway, um, Those are also really good if you want to like change the oil in your car, you know, or like figure out how to bake bread. Just, I just want to put it out there for anybody who's listening. You know, you guys haven't heard of YouTube. You YouTube is yeah. yeah. I just wanted okay. to recommend YouTube. I'm yeah. not sure if you've heard of it. Of, yeah. So that's going to be the big takeaway from our yeah. talk together. YouTube, check it out. YouTube. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, so yeah, we're going to push this video through more, even more through the channels because we're promoting their their agenda, the YouTube agenda. Oh That's yeah, right. exactly. Because right. <laughs> they need us to promote right. their, exactly, right. their agenda. So I'm not exactly sure how long, I think we've been going for kind of a while. So I, I want to wrap it up soon, but I know there was, um, did you guys still want to talk about the kind of like having space to be an artist, kind of making a living, um, like navigating, you know, because, you know, my intention with making this, with this podcast initially is, you know, for, for people who make things, for people who write songs or write poetry or, you know, and kind of being able to hear from people who are doing that in case they have obstacles or just kind of need a lift or they feel like they're doing it too much alone. They could tune in and, you know, maybe get an idea or just be like, okay, there are other people, you know, doing this. Like, I don't, you know, I don't feel so isolated. And, and I, I think I'll take that tip that Laura gave. So I think it might be important um, to to touch on this because you all mentioned it. And so the just to, to tell people what we're talking about, these guys had talked about how sometimes the needs of being an artist, like having enough space to to write and having downtime versus the pressure of feeling like you have to be engaged on social media and connecting with your audience. Or Laura, you were talking about like needing to, like the financial needs, you know, of of being alive and then also how music is 
you know, often mostly free these days and kind of, kind of how do you, how do you navigate that and, 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 and show up the way you want to show up. And so I guess to simplify, I would just put the question out there. What, are, what are, what's a challenge that you face in that area? And then what's, what's something that you feel like has worked for you? That is actually a tool that you use to navigate some of that. Yeah. I, uh, for me, I mean, this could be like a whole nother podcast, but I'll try to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. I, know. Right. Um, I mean, for me, for, for me, like song, I'm not one of those people that journals every day and writes every day. I'm, I'm like songs come to me at random times in the middle of the night, in the shower, in the car. Um, and I, like, this isn't the best advice, but I, I always feel like I have to have my house completely clean and everything, no clutter and everything, every email to taken care of before I can, I always think I need, you know, these hours of time to write a song. And so I don't write very much, <laughs> but, and that's, that's, I guess that is my, one of my biggest challenges is just taking the time to sit down and write. Cause it, it's fun too. Once I start doing it, I mean, even last night, just thinking about this podcast, I was like, oh, I'm going to try to write. And I, 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 I have a song I want to write about a snow globe. And I, I've been wanting to write this song for two or three years. And I have like two lines. And I, you know, and I didn't, I didn't get very far last night, but I tried. And it's like, the song is going to come at some point. Um, but it's, I find it so hard to do the thing the thing that's actually the fun thing because I'm like, well, I need to make sure I have work lined up for the next six months or whatever. And it's, it's very imbalanced. And, you know, I I think I just have to mentally tell myself like, okay, it's okay. You can put that down for today, you know, do the thing that's going to also keep your career going. And, um, and it's, that's the, the fun part too, is writing songs. Um, and for me, I, I usually know a song is good when I'm playing it all day and all night. Like, like with this one time I wrote a song and I forgot to go teach this class I had to teach. Like I was loving the song so much that I, they, the school called me and they said, Laura, are you coming today? I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> I got so lost in my songwriting. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but the, the challenge is, is just. Making- well, that's interesting too, though. So it's like giving yourself permission to say, I could put this other stuff down to write this song, but maybe now that you tell that story, maybe there's a fear, like, you know, cause you missed that class. Maybe there's a fear. If I, if I go into this creative <laughs> space too, too wholeheartedly, yeah. I may, I may skip work, you know? <laughs> I know. It was crazy. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just giving myself, I think, oh, should I go on a retreat somewhere? Like sometimes I leave my house or sometimes I'll pick up a different instrument. Um, I think, okay, let me pick up the, you know, the ukulele or the mandolin and, and try to have that help me. So. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Thank you, Laura. Uh Um, I can totally relate to Laura's uh, feeling like you need to clean the entire house before you can write a song. Uh, which I think that's a good uh, a good thing about songwriting is it keeps my house cleaner because I don't want to write songs. And so I clean the house for hours at a time <laughs> until it's spick and span. I have that same thing. Like, oh, I can't definitely can't sit down to write a song because the house isn't clean. So I need to go do all the dishes. And that's a weird thing because I think it is just like, I don't want to sit in that chair and have the feeling of not being able to write something, which is the worst feeling ever. And so I find all these other things that I have to do first before I can actually do it, which I think that is not the opposite of that would be good songwriting advice, which would be to yeah leave everything aside and just, and write. Uh, and I think for me, one of the big, problems is just the distractions of feeling like you need to be active on social media and and connecting with people all the time. And I feel like good songwriting happens when I shut everything off and spend the whole day in quiet and, and sit at the piano and, and write and 
don't do anything else, but that's harder and harder to do because I have this kind of nagging feeling that, oh, I have to promote this show that's happening in two weeks. Uh, and how do I do that? And, <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, for me, I, I kind of envy those people. I've heard like, uh, Nick Cave and maybe Paul Simon that they actually like go to work to write songs. Like I think Nick Cave dresses up in a suit. Maybe he's always in a suit, but like, you know, he dresses up in a suit, goes into the office and writes from nine to five or something like that. And I, I think I've heard the same thing about Paul Simon and I would like to do something like that, but I've never had the the ability to do it. And what I tend to do is write a bunch of songs during a period of time, record them, put them out, and then do all of the promoting stuff for six months or a year. And I don't write a lot during that time. And then it kind of builds up again and I start writing again. But I'm also like Laura, not one of those people who is writing every day or thinking about writing every day. I think in some ways, letting it build up in your unconscious is helpful to what ends up coming out later. But. I tend, I tend to write a couple songs when I'm in the studio, like when we're at, it's like we're yeah. making the record and then I get inspiration. That happens a lot actually. There's Liam and I always notice that like near the end of a session, I tend to write some of my best songs because the pressure's off and I know I already have an album and I know I already have enough songs that are good. And then it's like, okay, let's just add a couple more. Well, that's easy. But like when I'm looking at a blank slate, it's always the worst. Um, yeah. <laughs> and in fact, we've, we've used uh, like, if Justin's, you know, maybe seven songs in to a record and is, has a block somewhere, we just book studio time and it always works. It's like, <laughs> oh, there's, there's this Wait, that date again. coming. You mean if you have writer's block, you just... Uh, book studio time book studio time we I'm know we've got seven studio, songs but like the pressure yeah. of the fact that you have reserved a space and paid a deposit and and booked musicians to play and there's a big economic problem happening you're like well i better have stuff for them to play because i'm already like spending all this money oh my gosh <laughs> yeah exactly I mean, yeah. I, may not work for everyone but but, but i totally do that too i like i i work better under pressure if i'm like yeah. okay yeah this is happening and yeah, sometimes my producer will say, you know, go in that room and finish that song, you know, or like what you said to me, Justin, with my, my, I can't wait to turn eight. Yeah. And I just needed a little nudge. And you said, oh, yeah, finish that, you know, finish that. No. <laughs> yeah, I feel like there's all these tricks that we can use to kind of, I, like, manipul manipulate ourselves, you know. Yeah. Like taking the pressure off, putting extra pressure on. On, yeah, right. <laughs> um, I feel like cleaning is something. I, I'm not a huge fan of cleaning, but I, no. I actually feel like it helps me organize. I, I feel like it's easier to write a song. I mean, of course, there's the aspect of cleaning to procrastinate, but then I also feel like there's the aspect of like, I can see better. You know what I mean? There's yeah. like all these distractions of like, oh, this, oh, this, you know, and then I feel like the song can kind of come in because there's not so much clutter, you know, like the clutter in my brain is matching the clutter totally in my space. Well, Liam, you have such a clean space. So you must have a philosophy about that. I do have a philosophy about it. Um, and it's something that I've arrived at pretty recently. Uh, it's, I just, I mean, there's a, I, I'm not sure if it's a pressure we put on ourselves or just, uh, just the nature of uh, the business of what we do. But I feel like a lot of us feel like we have to do everything. Uh, wow. Like we have to be awesome at social media and we have to be awesome at, at uh, you know, administration, organizational business. We have to be awesome at these things and awesome at these things. And sometimes we're just good at songwriting or we're just good at, you know, uh, tracking or whatever like that. So what I've started doing is outsourcing. Um, and mm -hmm. so like I, I barter with someone to, uh, who comes and cleans my house <laughs> and I barter with someone who, uh, who does my social media happens to be my partner. And we, you know, we, it's a domestic bartership, but, uh, but I'm terrible at that stuff and I hate it. And, um, and so once I gave it up to her and she loves it, she loves to do it, then that's off my plate and I can concentrate on 
um, totally. doing the things that I'm, that I'm good at, that I, that, that I, that are in my skill set instead of trying to be, you know, uh, this, whatever the word is, jack yeah. of all trades. Well, I feel like the truth is we're all, each of us as a person is a small, is a small business, right? So that right. If we're, whatever a couple of sizes bigger would have like five, a team of five people. I mean, I don't know, maybe you already have a team of five people, but you know what I mean? Like, you know, there's like the marketing, there's so many, there's so many buckets. So exactly. I think it's great. That's uh, such a good reminder too. It, like, the reminder that yeah nobody can be good at all of the things that right. need to be you know it's a good right. reminder I mean, we have to be good enough at them to know that if we hire someone that they're doing their job exactly yes. Taylor Swift she's good at all of them oh. yeah Tay Tay's <laughs> got it she's a you know she's like Prince she's a, yeah <laughs> not so much a small business but yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. well it's thank you team. guys so much for sharing your experience I think sometimes like even you know just hearing that other people are grappling with stuff. It's not so much like having a solution, you know, one size fits all, but just like hearing from other working artists is, is really meaningful. So I'm happy to hear about the house cleaning from everyone that I thought that was a secret thing for myself, but <laughs> it's totally what happens all the time. Yeah, exactly. Who knew? I'd never clean the house if it wasn't for songwriting. <laughs> hey, Liam, one last question. How do you approach, if it's not your partner, for example, how do you approach the, the barter conversation? Um, you know, usually it's something, uh, you know, the, the things that I can offer are, I mean, it, usually have something to do with like uh, lessons, some kind of tutoring or lessons. So like guitar lessons or uh, voice lessons or, you know, things like that or, or songwriting lessons or something like that. Usually it's usually something like that, you know, something that's very firmly, you know, in my everyday skill set that, uh, that is a value, you know? Yeah. Um, but I suppose it could be anything that, you know, it could be dog walking. I mean, I, you know, right. there, the, the thing is that I think a lot of people don't think about, about barter ships. Um, it's not the first thing that comes to mind and, you know, it's totally legal and we can do it and yeah. there are no taxes involved, you know, that kind of thing. So I, I think it's an, uh, it's a great tool for, for, um, you know, like you said, like one person, small business for, yeah. I, you know, I also, I'll say one, I also feel like it has an evening out factor of like the value of something, you know what I mean? Because if you're, say you were mentoring someone's child or giving them some sort of lessons and their parent was doing your taxes, like normally the fee by the hour for the taxes would be more than the lessons. But when you have the one-to-one -one interaction, like the value of the two things, you know what I mean? You, totally. I feel like it's a great, um, leveler to look at how our, the marketplace kind of skews value and and but when it's personal uh you know like i would love someone to like make me like vegan vegetarian meals <laughs> and i would do like anything musical for them you know just throwing it out there is that what you're doing right now i think, I think it just happened, I think it just happened. anybody else want to put something out there <laughs> right yeah Amazing vegan meals <laughs> I'll do anything musical for you. <laughs> she said it here. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Cool. Well, thank you, Laura Doherty. Thank you, Justin Roberts. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Liam. Thanks for having me, Anne. Thanks so much for sharing um, with everybody, and we'll talk to you guys soon. Great. Thanks, Anne. All right, thanks. Thanks so much for joining us. If you know someone who would enjoy or benefit from this podcast, please share it with them. Thanks so much. Much love.